okay, now that way if our friends missing anything, then uh, they can watch this lecture videos. Okay, now uh, the common form of a polynomial function is as the following. Uh, if the degree of the polynomial is n, then it will be a n, a sub n, x to the n plus a subscript n minus one, x to the n minus one, and so on and so forth until we have a sub one of x plus a sub zero. Now, where the n The n here refers to the degrees. Okay, let's say for example, if I have this polynomial, this polynomial uh, p x equals to uh, five x to the four uh, minus seven x cubed uh, plus three x squared minus four x plus six. Let's say I have something like this. This is a polynomial. Now, the leading coefficient, the leading coefficient is the coefficient of the term with highest degree. Now, this is our A4. This is our A4, subscript four. Now, because the N is equals to four, it means this polynomial is the degree of four and the leading coefficient is five. Now, I know this notation here, this notation here, uh, let me highlight that. This notation that we have here seems to be quite scary, uh, but it just gives us the basic pattern of a polynomial. Okay, now let's say for example, uh, what is A subscript three? What is the coefficient of the term with the degree three? As you see, the coefficient with the, for the term with the degree three is negative seven. The coefficient of the term with the degree two is three. The coefficient of the term with the degree one is negative four, and the constant term, the term without any x, is six. Okay. Let me see if anybody have any question. Let me go back. Uh, everybody's okay with this? Yeah. Okay. Now uh, let me go back. Oh. Uh, what's up? Somebody raised hand earlier. Oh. Yes, Joanne. No. Um. I pushed the uh, thumbs up. Oh. Okay. Okay. Okay, let me go back to my share screen. Okay, now, uh, what happened is then, I have a, oh, give me a second. Where is my, okay, here you are. Now, uh, the leading coefficient leading coefficient is a sub n. Now in this case, it's five. Now leading term, is a sub n x to the n. So in this case, in this case here, the leading term is 5 x to the 4. Now, 
uh, I wonder if you remember uh, if you watched the lecture video already and there's something called far end behavior now far end behavior Uh, actually consists of only the following thing. Oops. Uh, depends on the degree. If the degree is even, then the graph will be from the positive infinity and we don't know what happened in between and then it will go to positive infinity. Either that situation or it comes from negative infinity and then something happened in between we don't know and then go back to negative infinity now in fact we can say uh, if the degree is even and it will be like uh, uh, from from the top positive infinity to positive infinity that's when the leading coefficient is positive now while uh, if it's uh, from negative infinity to negative infinity, that's when the leading coefficient is negative. Now you can imagine uh, the, the example that we have from the past. Uh, for example, if we have y equals to x squared, now you know that the leading coefficient is positive. So the leading coefficient is uh, 1, which is positive, and the degree is even. Right now, then we know that it's a uh, the problem opens up. While if I put y equals to negative, let's say one half x squared, like the one you have in your test, as I remember, okay, the leading coefficient is negative one half, which is negative, and because the degree is even, then it will be a parabola facing down. Now, those are things that we basically already know. Now, what happens if the leading coefficient is, I mean, the degree is odd? Suppose, uh, if, let me write it down, the general idea first. If the degree is odd, then it will be either like this. Again, we don't know what happened in the middle. We don't know what happened here. That will uh, That's the detail we'll put in a later section. Now, or it will be like this. So either it's from negative infinity, somewhere happen in between, and then as far uh, the further we go to the right, we'll go to positive infinity, or it comes from positive infinity from the far left, and then go to the negative infinity in the far right. Again, we don't know what happened in the middle. Now, if we want uh, to know which one for which one, then at this point, we look at the leading coefficient. Now, the leading coefficient is positive. It will give us this shape here. And if the leading coefficient is negative, it will give us top bottom. Okay, now if you remember the case of, for example, uh, x cubed, or actually you don't need x cubed, you can just look at linear uh, linear equation. Let's say uh, y equals to 2x minus 3. Now here the leading coefficient is leading coefficient is 2, but the degree is the degree is 1, which is odd. Right now we know the graph actually looks like this, right? Which basically follow this pattern, which means uh, we, as we go further to the left it goes to negative infinity. When we go further to the right, it goes to positive infinity. When we go to the left, when we go to the left, actually the actual graph is the y intercept is, I'm sorry, I still don't get used to my pen, uh, but uh, this is the, the y intercept, right? And then the slope is positive too. So the further we go to the right, it will go to infinity, while the further we go to the left, it goes to negative infinity. Okay, uh, I hope that's clear enough. Any questions so far? Let me go back to the screen. Any question? Good. Okay, let's go back to share screen.
Hey, Thomas. Yes. Uh -huh. Are we just going to be talking about chapter three today or are we going to be covering 2.7 at all? Uh, I, oh, yeah, I, I would like, I really thought that I already finished the domain of uh, that composition of function, but I guess I need to go over that again, uh, maybe later toward the end of today's. But uh, 2.7 pretty much has no relation with the polynomial, the, our discussion today. Okay. Um, I just need to, at some point, maybe not today's discussion, but maybe like another discussion day, mm -hmm. go over um, composite uh, functions, just finding the domain and range, because the video to me was um, just a little bit confusing. I feel like maybe just going over it again or getting some, some practice would be nice. Oh, okay. Yeah, I will do so. I will do so. Uh, let me finish 3.1 first then, and then maybe uh, before I get to 3.2, then I go over that 2.7 little bit. Okay, thank you. Sure, sure. Okay, that's for the far end's behavior. Uh, uh, let's go to the second topic of this section is intermediate value theorem. Intermediate Value theorem. Now, this intermediate value theorem applies not only for polynomials; it actually applies to all continuous functions. Uh, however, we will just discuss the situation in uh, this polynomial for now. Uh, basically, the intermediate value theorem says the following: Let uh, a function f x be a continuous function. Now, a uh, polynomial is one of the family of functions that is continuous. Now, uh, what intermediate value theorem start with, if you have a continuous function uh, and uh, f a uh, n f b, uh, has opposite sign so you imagine let's say we have a coordinate system here and let's say this is a the value of the function is here while b has the value function is there so you see f a is negative f b is positive now because the function is continuous then uh, there must be zero. A, yeah, yes, that's right. There must be a zero in between. There must be a value. Uh, we say there's a C. Let me write it down. And then there is X equals to C. Maybe more than one. Maybe more than one such uh, X. Such that fc equals to zero and the c is in between a and b now, i write this as an open interval here okay now the by the way the the actual version of uh intermediate value theorem is the following the actual version of intermediate value theorem is the following let fx be a continuous function. And then uh, uh, fa is not equal to fb. So it doesn't have to be uh, opposite sign. Let's say uh, a here, this is fa. This is F A and B here, and this is F B. So this, this is F B. Then uh, 
for every value between FA and FB, let's say this thing here, for every value, then for any value, any value between F A and F B so let's say I randomly pick this guy here now according to the theorem because it's continuous right then there must be a C hitting that Y so in this case I draw it to show you that uh, that C doesn't have to be unique it may be this guy here that gives you this y, uh, this guy here that gives you the same y, and this guy here that gives you the same y. Okay, for any value between F A and F B, uh, uh, there is at least uh, an x equals to C such that FC is in that interval, is in uh, between. Give me a second, Chris. Uh, FA and FB. Uh, now that's the general uh, concept of intermediate value theorem. But the one we will use, especially in this uh, polynomial function here, is only just the, the earlier version that I gave you. We will just, we will just need this one. Okay. Uh, yes, Chris. Um, so anything between f of a and f of b is c or has a possibility of being c? Uh, you can pick any value between a uh, with between f a and f b, and there must be uh, an x equals to c goes there. Uh, let's say let's say for example let's say for example let's do do a concrete example. Uh, let's say for example I have uh, f x equals to uh, x squared minus four. We know the graph. Uh, looks like this. Now, now, you tell me what axis you want to deal with. Let's say uh, uh, x equals to uh, zero and x equals to four. Maybe I use five, x equals to five. Now, f zero is zero, uh, I'm sorry, not zero, negative four, my bad. While F five is what? That's 25 times four, that's 21. 21, yeah, mm -hmm. 21. Okay, so now it means because they have the opposite sign, one of them negative, the other one is positive, then there must be the, their, must be a zero between x equals zero and x equals to five. And we can confirm actually one of the zero, uh, one of the zero is what? If you look at this. One of the is zero it the, is one of the zero is two. Uh huh. What is the other one, by the way? Negative two. Negative uh, two. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so so when we detect from x equals to zero, the value is negative four, and when x equals to five, the value is twenty five. Now in between, on the journey from x equals to zero, which gives us negative four, my bad. Uh, uh, from here and then on my journey from x equals to zero, which is negative four and going to x equals to five, uh, whose y is 21. Somewhere in between I must cross x axis. Is it okay? 
Yeah. Okay. I see it now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it doesn't. This this intermediate value theorem, however, only tell us the existence. It doesn't tell us what will the zero be. It just tell us there must be a zero in between. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. tell us what's the zero, but it tells us there must be a zero. It's just like okay. Uh, it's like uh, there's something there. Like yeah, there's something there. Two, uh -huh. If these but, two things exist, then this will probably exist. Uh, not probably, then for sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, as long as they have uh, the the value at two uh, two axes have opposite signs, there must be a zero in between. Now, okay. it doesn't tell us how many zeros in between, how many x-intercepts. Uh, it doesn't tell us what are or what is the x intercept. There must be just that we know something is there. We know someone in that room, for example. Okay. Uh, however, okay. The, uh, let me continue a little bit before I forget it. Uh, in fact, this is quite important. The converse of uh, intermediate failure theorem is not true. Okay. Uh, what I want to say is uh, the converse. Let me write it down. The converse. of intermediate value theorem is not true. In other words, uh, if F A and F B have same sign, then there is no guarantee there is a zero in between there is any zero <clears throat> Now the converse is uh, is the following. Uh, we had earlier. Let me go back. We had earlier. I say that if uh, F A and F B have opposite sign, uh, then there must be a zero in between, right? Now, yeah. but what happens if they have the same sign? What happens if they have the same sign? Then nothing can be said. There's no guarantee. Now. Uh, let me show you the picture underneath oh, because let's say suppose I have uh, FA let's say is positive and FB also positive now we don't know if the graph it has to be continuous but we don't know if the graph will go this way which means there's no x-intercept but the graph may also be like this which means there's an x-intercept does it make sense mm -hmm. yes okay. So, so if they have the same sign, we cannot say anything. There's no I, intermediate value theorem does not say anything if they have the same sign. Intermediate value theorem only applies if they have different sign. Okay. Uh, any question? So, on like a on a test, if there was a question like this, what would mm -hmm. be like? The final solution would it just be like yes or no or that's right it would be the yes no problem okay yeah so all you need to check is what is f a what is f b and so on and so forth let me let me pick a question from the book give me a second uh, let's say for example we pick question uh, we pick question number, number, uh, how about number eight? How about number eight from 3.1? Number eight from section 3.1, fx equals to Two x to the four plus three x minus two, and they tell us to observe at a equals zero and b equals to one. So 
basically want to see, we want to see if between x equals zero and x equals to one, if there's any x intercept in between them. Now the way we see, we find out, find out what is F zero. What is F zero? Negative two. That's right. Uh, that one is easier, right? We, actually, yeah. uh, by the way, are you, you are FR, right? Yes. Yes, thank you, FR. Uh, so <laughs> actually, uh, if we look back a bit more, I forgot to mention this earlier. Remember the constant term of a polynomial? In this case, it's negative two. Right? Uh, now, the constant term will always give us the y-intercept. Well, because okay. that's basically basically set all the x's to zero, so we are only left with the constant term. Okay, now, how about f1? Three. F1 is three. three. Now, let me look, look back to the, the sketching pad here. Now, f0 is negative two, and f1 is three. So then from here we see, because there are opposite signs, there must be a, a zero in between. Does it make sense? No, because okay. one of them is negative and the other one is positive, uh, then there is, actually I should insert at least one uh, zero. between x equals zero and x equals one. Okay, now the thing is we don't know how many zeros there. We just know somebody there in that interval. Okay, now let's go on further. Uh, what happened if we have a function that is already factored for us? Uh, we are actually about to graph this now. At least sketch the graph. Yeah. Polynomial in factor form. Uh, even though it seems to be scary, it's actually not. And I guarantee you that. <coughs> So let's say, for example, for example, we have uh, p x equals to uh, x plus four x minus two and x minus five squared. We want to sketch this graph, the graph of this function. Uh, uh, before I really go on, can you? Can anybody tell me what's the degree of this polynomial? Four. That's right. What is the leading coefficient? One. One. Okay. So the degree is four. The leading coefficient a sub n is equals to one. So the far end behavior we expect will be from the positive infinity. Uh, we don't know what happened in between, right? But mm -hmm. we know at the end, we'll go to positive infinity too. Everybody okay with this? Mm -hmm. Now, yes. so what we want to do right now is to fill in the details what happened in between. Okay, now the easiest thing we can do, of course, to find the y-intercept. The y-intercept will be uh, when you set x equals to zero. Uh, I think when I set x equals to zero, I get, happen to be a very large number. I get negative 200. Is it right? Zero, yes. negative 200. Okay. Now then, second, how about the x-intercepts? So to find the x-intercept, I set the px to be zero. Now, the nice thing is because it's already in factor form, uh, we get all the zeros right away. Is it right? So uh, 
the x intercepts are x equals to negative 4, or x equals to 2, and x equals to 5. Now notice that because the exponent for this x minus 5 here is 2, then we say x minus 5 is the zero with multiplicity of 2. Now we will see the significance of the multiplicity much later. But at least we now know that the x-intercepts are negative 4, 0, 2, 0, and 5, 0. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Those are the x-intercepts. Uh, the sketch right now is pretty much like this. Uh, one of them is what? Negative 4, and then the other one is 2. two and five. five, right? Okay, yes. now we know that it will be from the positive infinity there and later on it will go to negative infinity. So far so good? Mm -hmm. Okay, now remember how we use uh, sine graph in the past? Yes. Now the sine graph, if it is positive, it means it is above x axis. If it is negative, it means it's below x axis. Remember that? Okay, so uh, basically using this, uh, this x intercepts here, we already get the critical numbers. Now, let me do the sign graph. Let me do the sign graph. And you will see later on that it match what we have, what we have here. Okay, let me do the sign graph. We know the x intercept uh, are negative four. So when x equals to negative four, the y value is zero. When x equals to two, the y value is zero. When x equals to five, the value also zero. Now let's do testing point. When x equals to zero, what's the value? Positive. Is, is it positive? Let me see. I think we did this earlier. When p uh, when x equals zero, what is p zero? <laughs> Don't think too hard. It's negative because there's two positives and one negative. Oh, that's, yes, that's, that's true. Right. Yeah, okay, but at the same time, you uh, to see it better, you know that we did y-intercept, right? And the y-intercept is? Negative. Negative 200. Uh, negative 200, right? So that's how we know that the value here is negative. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, uh, let me ask you to find out what is the sign when x is to the left of x equals to negative 4. Let's say we choose x equals to negative 5. Let me write the polynomial again here. Okay, when x equals to negative 5, when I plug in here, that's negative. That's negative here. But for the last uh, factor, it will always be positive. Is it right? Yes. So two negative, two negatives, it becomes still uh, positive. Now, notice that x equals to negative 4, if we look back, x equals to negative 4 is a zero with single multiplicity. Hello, who is that? <laughs> yeah. uh, x equals to negative 4 is a zero whose multiplicity is 1. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, so because the multiplicity is 1, then when when x equals to negative 4, that's a critical number that guaranteed the sign to the left and the sign to the right must be different. If the multiplicity is odd, let me say it again. If the multiplicity is odd, then the sign to the left of that critical number, the sign to the right of that critical number must be different. You see what I mean? Yes. Uh, what? Can you repeat that again, please? Now, x equals to negative four is a zero with a single multiplicity. It's um, multiplicity of one because yes. the exponent here is one now mm -hmm. if you have a zero with single multiplicity 
then the sign to the left and to the right of that critical number must be different. The okay. sign here must be different. Okay, yeah, because this is a single multiplicity. To be more precise, it's a odd multiplicity. Now, let's try again. Let's try again. What happened if I choose here, here? Uh, if I choose an X in this interval between two to five, let's say X equals to three, can you compute or find what's the value, positive or negative? Using the positive. old way. Using the old way, it will be positive here, right? Mm -hmm. It will be a positive here, and it will be positive here too, right? All positive actually. So this is positive. Now notice that the critical number between the left hand side here and the right hand side here uh, is two. And two is a critical number with multiplicity of one because the exponent here is one. Are you with me? Such that because the multiplicity is odd, then once you jump across that critical number, there must be a change of sign because the multiplicity of this zero, the multiplicity is odd. Is it okay? So the way we did it before, the way we did it before, we always picked a number, uh, an x in this interval, let's say. Let's pick the number x equals to zero. And then we plug that zero into this polynomial, we find the sign. We pick x equals to negative five, for example, and find the sign, x equals to three to find the sign. Now we have a better technology. That better technology is by looking at the, the exponent. If the exponent is odd, then if the exponent is odd for this x ah. four, that's a zero with odd multiplicity, then when I jump across that critical number, I need to change the sign. Because x equals two is a zero with odd multiplicity, then when I jump across that critical number, I change the sign. Are you with me? Yes. Okay, yes. Now, yes. now you see that when x equals to five, that's a zero with what multiplicity? Two. Multiplicity of two. Because the multiplicity is even, then when I jump across, I will keep the sign. I will keep the sign. It will be still be positive. Are you with me? Yes. Yes. Okay, now that helps us to, from that sign graph, then we can put more uh, into what the actual, uh, this actual sketch of graphs uh, be. Suppose this is the rectangular coordinate system. Uh, and then I have x equals to negative four here. That's an x intercept, right? We have another x intercept, x equals to two, and we have x equals to five. Now, we know from the far end behavior that it will come from positive infinity going down to negative four because that's x intercept. And then it go to the y intercept, uh, uh, zero negative 200. And then it goes to the x intercept two. So far, is it okay? Compare that with the sine graph. Let me redo the sine graph. Sign graph x equals to negative four, x equals to two, x equals to five. Zero here, zero here, zero here. This is positive, which means, which means in this region, which means in this region, it should be the graph should be above x axis. And the sign here is negative, right? Which means between negative four and two, the graph should be below x-axis. Is it okay? Now then, between two and five, the sign is positive. So it must be above x-axis. Is it okay? Now yet, to the right of five, it doesn't change sign which means the graph will still be above x intercept.
Now, that's the sketch of the graph. Is it okay, everybody? Yes. Okay, now, yes. So the, uh, the, the attached key points that I want to explain here is how to use the sign graph that we learned before to help us sketching the graph. Right? If the sign is positive, it means it is above x-axis. If the sign is negative, it means it is below x-axis. Okay. Now, somebody once asked me this question, Thomas, uh, does the sign always change uh, between critical numbers? And from here, then I can, indefinite, uh, I can answer it uh, with definite answer. The answer is no. It depends on the multiplicity of that zero. It depends on the multiplicity of that zero. Now, maybe I use another color. Now, negative four is an odd multiplicity. That's why, that's why then the sign change. Two, also an odd multiplicity. That's why the sign change. But five here is a zero with even multiplicity. So the sign does not change. The sign here happens to be both positive Right now, it is possible that it's both negative. What we know if the zero is even, I mean, <clears throat> the multiplicity is even, then there's no change of sign uh, around that zero. If the zero is odd, <clears throat> if the zero is odd, then there must be a change of sign around that zero. Now, let me pick a question from our textbook. Uh, let's say, for example, I pick um, you know, let me pick number 26. Let me pick number 26. Number 26, again, that's from section 3.1. What page is that? Uh, page 191. 191, thank you. And we have the function <laughs> fx equals to x cubed minus x squared minus x plus 1. Now, let me give you one minute to factor this. Now, earlier we had the factorized, uh, factorized form, right? This time it's not factored, but we can factor it. Let me give you like one minute to factor it. See, I hope you're done. That's equals to uh, x squared parentheses x minus one minus parentheses x minus one. And then we have that common factor x minus one. So I have this x minus one. Oh, I can factor it further. So this is x plus 1, x minus 1. Is it right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so that difference of square here, now it becomes, so the difference of square here, it becomes this. Now let me combine them. So now it becomes x plus 1 times x minus 1 square. Is it right? Mm -hmm. and then. Uh, 
let's start with the critical numbers. The critical numbers are, oh, the y-intercept first. The, the y-intercept will be, I think it's zero, one, right? That's the constant, as I remember, the constant is one. Yeah, uh -huh. the constant is one. And then how about the x-intercepts? The x intercepts are negative 1, 0 and 1, 0. The sine graph. The sine graph. x equals negative 1 and x equals to 1, both of them the zeros, right? <clears throat> uh, the y-intercept is what again? Uh, y-intercept is one. Zero, it's one. 1. 0, 1, so it's positive. So what's the sign here? Negative. Negative, why? Because the m value is 1. Because the multiplicity of the zero here is one, which is odd. odd. That's, yeah, that's right. Now, how about the sign here then? Well, that would probably be positive because the multiplicity is two there, even. That's right, that's right. Uh, because the multiplicity of x equals to one as a zero is two, which is even, then the sign here will also be even. I mean, it will also be positive, the same sign. By the way, who is the one who talked to me earlier, just now? Uh, that's me, Regan. Oh, okay. I'm glad you're here, Regan. <laughs> Regan. Uh, yeah, it took me a while, but I made it, yeah. Okay, great, great, great. Okay, <laughs> now, let's continue. Uh, now we get the sketch. Actually, we follow the sign graph earlier. The y-intercept is 0, 1, and then the x-intercepts are negative 1, 0, and 1, 0. Uh, what is the far end behavior, by the way? The degree is odd. The leading coefficient is 1. So it should be negative infinity to positive infinity style. Do you remember that? Now, let me go back to the sign graph again. And you see here, it's from, to, to the left of negative one, it should be below x-axis. To the right of positive one, it should be above x-axis. So uh, as we go to negative infinity, the, if the x goes to negative infinity, the y also goes to negative infinity. And then once it crosses x equals to negative 1, it goes above x-axis and touch that y-intercept. Yet when x equals to 1, when x equals to 1, we have positive on the left-hand side, which means above x-axis, and positive to the right of 1, which also above x-axis. So it goes to positive infinity. Like this. Is it okay? So the sketch of the graph is approximately like this. As we go to the left, far left, it goes to negative infinity. If we go to the far right, it goes to positive infinity. Is it okay? Yeah. Now, uh, do you need a break or we can continue? I'm fine. I, I'd say just keep going. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's fine too. So. Okay, uh, let me go on then. Uh, I will still use this as the lecture today. Oh my God, they're moving. Why are they moving? <laughs> They're doing it for you? 
this is class. <laughs> We're in class. Oh. Uh, we oh. will have two types of division that talk? we will learn. Long they division. They could talk about you. <laughs> but my dad said to not talk to strangers, but I'm not doing it. <laughs> 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 That's your friend's way. <laughs> hey, don't oh. worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> my wife need to actually. <laughs> my wife have to bring my son to the other floor <laughs> because he wants to be on the on the screen too. You know. <laughs> okay, uh, let's continue. Uh, long division. Long division is of course uh, quite important too, but not as important uh, as. Uh, much as synthetic division that I asked you to watch on the lecture video. But let's do one example. I pick example from our book uh, on long division. By the way, this is something you already learned in intermediate algebra. That's why I kind of like, oh, you know what? Just watch lecture video to refresh your mind. But let me refresh your mind also here. Uh, let's say, for example, I pick a question from page uh, 199. Anybody wants to pick any question between number one to number eight? One to... Yeah, number one to number eight. Let's pick number four first. Let's pick number four first. So basically, I need to divide uh, 3x cubed minus 5x squared minus 4x minus 8 divided by 2x squared plus x. Now you will see later on uh, in one of the, or I think two of the lecture videos I asked you to watch, there's a comparison between long division and synthetic division. Uh, but we primarily use long division if the denominator is nonlinear. You see, we have the degree of two here on the denominator. Now, if we have that situation, then we have to use long division. If the denominator, the divisor, is a linear form, then we can use synthetic division. Now, let's do it here. The guy on the numerator will be inside the house. while the divisor, the guy on the denominator, will be outside the house. Now, then we start. Now, 2x squared times what gives us 3x cubed? 2x squared times what gives us 3x cubed? Now, we definitely need an x, is it right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now two times what gives us three? Uh, we can do the reverse. Three divided by two is three half. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, two x squared times three over two x will give us three x cubed. Now then, I need to distribute this guy with this 2x squared, that's how I get that 3x cubed, but also to this x, which will give me positive uh, 3 over 2x squared. Now then, we will subtract. Now, what will negative 5 minus 3 half be? Negative 5 minus 3 over 2. 13 halves, negative. N negative 13 halves, that's right. So this will be negative 13 over 2x squared. And I bring the rest down. Now 
Okay, and I will start the cycle again. We start the cycle again. Now, 2x squared times what give me negative 3 half x squared. Let me write it here. 2x squared times what equals to negative 13 over 2x squared. Do we need any x? No. No. Uh, so we just need to the coefficient, huh? I definitely need a negative, right? Mm -hmm. We change the sign now. Two times what give us thirteen over two? I need thirteen, and the denominator has to be two, so I should be having four here. So you can do 13 over 2 divided by 2. So I will get uh, negative 13 over 4 here to give me negative 13 <coughs> over 2x squared. Don't forget, I have to distribute that guy. I need to distribute this guy with 2x squared and with x. Therefore, I will have negative 13 over 4x here. Now, when we subtract, we know the first terms here will cancel, right? Now then, what will negative 4 minus negative 13 over 4 be? 3 fourths. Three, four. That's good. Yeah, just be very careful that when we, uh, what happened here, we are not adding them. We are actually subtracting. So negative four x minus negative thirteen over four x. Okay, so we get uh, yes three four x minus eight. Now, once the degree here is less than the degree of the divisor, then we can stop. Okay, the degree here is degree of one, while the divisor is degree of two. Is that right? Now, therefore, therefore, the quotient is, the quotient is, let me bring this down. The quotient is therefore three over two x minus 13 over four plus. Now we usually say this is the quotient this will be the remainder. This is the remainder. Okay. Which I will put on the numerator 3 over 4x minus 8 over 2x squared plus x. Okay. So the remainder will be on the numerator here. Okay, and the divisor is something I copy paste here. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Now, let's practice on this. Let me ask you to do, uh, let me write my own question. Uh, let me ask you to do, for example, 4x cubed minus Five x squared minus three big over x squared minus maybe plus. Uh, notice that there's a skip of exponents here. So your uh, when you put it in the long division form, it should be four x cubed minus 5x squared plus 0x minus 3. You see? You need to have a placeholder. You need to have a placeholder. Okay? And likewise, uh, when, when we divide this, uh, x squared plus 2, we have a skip also. 
So I, I strongly suggest you to have that uh, placeholder. But it's actually something you can, uh, if you want to ignore that zero X squared, it's fine. You know, but the one here, you need to put it. The green one, you have to put it as a placeholder. The yellow one is not necessary. Now, let me give you one or two minutes to try it on this. Thomas, in that yes. last in that last example, the solution, the fraction fraction is okay in the numerator there. Uh, that's actually okay at least for now. But uh, I uh, I'm okay with this. I'm okay with this. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. start uh, x squared times what give me 4x cubed 4x 4x so I put 4x here uh, uh, there's actually some some people wrote write this 4x they write it on the top here I don't mind but in my opinion it's supposed to be here because that's the place value you see mm -hmm. right Okay, now uh, x squared times 4x give us 4x cubed. Now 0x times 4x will be 0x squared. I will just ignore it. Okay, and then 2 times 4x is 8x. Now the reason I write it here in yellow, uh, I said earlier that you can skip it if you want. I mean, you can just ignore it, right? Uh, but the the one that you need to remember when you plug them in under in the house, be sure that you actually keep uh, keep the place value. In other words, the the place holding thing. Okay. Now then, when I subtract here, of course, as we expect, this part here should cancel. Now this part here should go down. We because we subtract by zero x squared. And how about this guy here? Uh, negative eight x negative 8x and then this one I just carry it down is it okay everybody mm -hmm. yes now then we start the procedure again x squared times what give us negative 5x squared negative 5 negative 5 and then I distribute this negative 5 to each mm -hmm. term there give me negative 5x squared uh, plus 0x minus 10 so I will get I will get negative 8x and then plus positive seven. 7 plus 7. So the quotient now, the quotient now will be 4x minus 5 plus negative 8x plus 7 over x squared plus 2. So it's always plus the remainder. 
plus the remainder over the quote the denominator right yeah uh, but you are right you are right that we usually call this the remainder this is what we call the remainder yeah but uh that's why i say uh, the remainder over the divisor okay now let me go on i I'm sorry, I think I will take your break time because earlier we start late, right? 15 minutes late approximately. Uh, I hope you don't mind, but if you need me to take a break, let me know. Everybody? I'm okay. Okay, mm -hmm. okay let me go on with synthetic division. Synthetic division. Uh, here's the thing. Uh, let Px be a polynomial uh, B divided by x minus c. The thing is, it has to be in form of x minus c. It has to be in the form of x minus c. Uh, let's say, for example, so that we have a better, a better view. Uh, for example, if I have three uh, x squared minus five x plus seven over x minus two. So the polynomial is the p x is the guy on the top. At the bottom, we have x minus c. So what's the c here? Two. The C is two, that's right. Now, the way we set it up will be as the following. Uh, we will do that box. I think our textbook actually draw it differently, uh, but that's because they have hard time to write the way I write it here. Okay, if you watch the lecture video I give you on YouTube, most of them actually use my style. Now, uh, the coefficients of the numerator, the coefficient of the polynomial we want to divide, will be written inside. Okay, while the C equals to 2, I will write it here, outside the box on the second row. So you can think of this as, you can think of this as, uh, three rows. The first row will be the coefficients of the polynomial. Okay. The second row on the outside will be the C. And we will have the third row here for the quotient. Now, but be very careful if you have any jump here. Uh, the polynomial uh, happens to have uh, co non-zero coefficients for each one of them. Degree of 2, the coefficient is 3, degree of 1, coefficient is negative 5, the constant is, is positive 7, right? So there's no jump. There's We don't need any zero for the uh, placeholder, right? Okay, now here's the procedure for synthetic division. The first number always copy down here. The first number always copy down here. Everybody follow me, because this is more into a procedure. The first number copy down there. Now then, we will multiply this number here with 2. Whatever the C, 3 times 2 is? 6. six. Now you will write that 6 here. Now then, I'm sorry, it looks like negative 6, my bad. Let me erase that. Why I cannot erase that? Oh, no, what happened? Uh, there were so many things that I don't want to erase. What happened? Um, so, three times two give me six. Now, then, when I add this, what do I want? What do I get? One. 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 So, in this case, I add. Okay, not like the synthetic division there earlier. We always subtract, remember? Like yeah. here we add, here we add. 
Now, then you repeat the procedure. One times two is two. Now you put it here. So one times two, we write it here in the next column. Okay, now then on the last column, I'll put the separator. I still add this though, but that's my separator. Now, what does this mean? What does this synthetic division mean? Uh, what is the degree of this polynomial again? The top? Two. Degree two. of two. Now, if we divide by degree of one, then the quotient must be degree of? Two. Hmm? Two. Uh, degree of two divided by degree of one will be degree of one. So this three here will be the leading coefficient of degree of one. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. One. I should erase that two. Huh. <laughs> I said one, I wrote two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now then, uh, after that, we get that minus plus one here. So this is the quotient. This nine is the remainder. So, in the division that we're supposed to perform, if we use synthetic division, we get this answer. You can use long division and you get the same answer though, but you, as you saw earlier, long division is actually harder, not harder, it's longer to perform, if not harder. Now, if you are done, copying that down, let me ask you to try this. Example two. I make it a bit longer so that you enjoy the right. Uh, let's say I have five x cube uh, plus six uh, x squared minus three x plus four big over x plus maybe x plus three. Okay, you try. Hold on, somebody. Five and then six and then negative, negative three, three four. four and then what's the number outside negative three negative three that's right so somebody asked me earlier is it always have to be x minus c form the answer is yes but don't forget the c may be negative okay like in this case yeah. and then I write that. Five here, five times negative three is negative fifteen. I get negative nine here. What will this be? Twenty seven mm -hmm. becomes twenty four. That's negative seventy two. So this is negative sixty eight. Right? Yes. 
So then the quotient is five x to the second square. Second power five mm -hmm. x squared minus nine x plus twenty four minus sixty eight over x plus three. That's the quotient. Of course, you can also write it this way: five x squared minus nine x plus twenty four plus negative sixty eight over x minus three. Even though I prefer the first one, either one is fine. Is it okay, everybody? Yes. Hmm. Now. Let me go on to the last part of today's lesson then. Uh, the last part of today's lesson is on what do I want to name it here? Uh, remainder theorem and Uh, you will see uh, this chapter here you need to memorize a lot of theorems uh, so far we have a uh, far end behavior and we have intermediate value theorem now, in between, we learn tools, uh, and those are uh, long division and synthetic division. The one we use a lot is actually synthetic division. Now, in this section, uh, 3.2, after the tools, we will learn remainder theorem. and factor theorem. They are very, very closely related. Uh, so you can, we can say that we basically need to know how to do the uh, remainder theorem and factor theorem is a direct consequence of that. Now, what is remainder theorem? Remainder theorem says the following. If Px, a polynomial, is divided by x minus c and the quotient is qx with remainder r. Basically, uh, we have pretty much that Px divided by x minus c equals to Qx plus r over x minus c. Now, to relate to what we have earlier, let me copy paste. Let me copy paste this one. Second. Copy this. Okay, copy this. Okay, we have this earlier, right? Okay, we have this earlier. So uh, this is the QT, the QX. This is the QX. This is the quotient. This is the remainder. Okay, this is the PX. is the x minus c. 
Maybe I write it down uh, horizontally here. Okay, so uh, basically what we did was 5x cubed plus 6x squared minus 3x plus 4 over x plus 3. This is equal to 5x squared minus 9x plus 24 plus negative 68 over x plus 3. Everybody okay? Uh, I basically wrote what I uh, I basically write what I wrote earlier, but this time I write it horizontally. Now let's go back. Now imagine if I take this expression here and multiply each term by x minus c. If I multiply by the LCD, multiply by x minus c. Now what happened on the left hand side? If you multiply this guy here by x minus c. P of x. Uh, that would be p of x, that's right. Now what happened with this term here? When you multiply by x minus c, it will be x minus c times qx, is it right? Mm -hmm. And the last term, if I multiply by x minus c, r. that will be just r. Yep. Now, we go back to what we have done underneath here. Imagine if I multi we multiply this by multiply this by x plus 3. Now you do it, I give you one minute. If I multiply by the LCD, then I will get 5x cubed plus 6x squared minus 3x plus 4 equals to x plus 3 times 5x squared minus 9x plus 24 minus 68. I hope that's what you get also. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, so this is basically what they call the deficient, uh, uh, the deficient pattern. Now, but synthetic deficient say the following. If I go back to, synthet to this synthetic deficient, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, remainder theorem. If the polynomial divided by x minus c and you get this quotient to x, you have remainder r, then we can rewrite this box here. Uh, like this red, uh, this other box, right? Now, what the remainder theorem says is the following. What remainder theorem says is the following. Then, PC, if we replace the X by C, then the value will be equals to R. What does it mean? If we look back to our uh, pattern here, now imagine if, where's my pointer? 
Now imagine if I replace this x here by c. So I get p c equals to, what is this? Uh, three. Um, uh, in this case, we still use c. So c minus c, right? q c plus r. But what is c minus c? Zero. Zero. So consequently, consequently, p c equals to r. Now mm -hmm. let's apply that idea here. Let's apply that idea here. Now imagine if I replace the x by negative three. If I replace x to be negative three, if I replace x by negative three, so the p negative three, that's equals to what is this? Zero. Zero. So the whole thing here will be zero, right? Zero times whatever, and p negative three equals to sixty-eight. Now you may you may wonder, Thomas, why do I need to do this? Uh, if I want to compute p negative three, I can just put negative three replace negative three on the polynomial. That's true. That's true. So uh, basically, uh, for example, if I have this, I basically rephrase what we have earlier. So let's say the polynomial is 5x cubed my, uh, plus 6x squared minus 3x plus 4. And I ask you to compute what is the value of the polynomial uh, at negative 3. So you say, oh, you know what, Thomas, I will just replace the x by negative 3. Is it right? That's the way we did it before. Mm -hmm. Now, that, but right now we have an alternative way to do it. This is method one. Our method two is actually your performance in that division. It's faster. Uh, five, six, negative three, four, and I put negative three here. Five, negative 15, negative nine, 27, 44. Negative seventy-two. This is negative sixty-eight. So then, from there, we say, oh, p negative three equals to negative sixty-eight. Now, uh, the thing is, when it comes to polynomial, using synthetic division to find the value is actually faster. Is it okay? And Actually, let me say more. Let me say more. If I try to relate this to other information that we learned earlier, I can ask the following. Let's say, uh, continue from the previous example. From the previous example. Uh, is there any zero? between x equals to negative 3 and x equals to 1 or px equals to 5x cubed plus 6x squared minus 3x Plus four. Remember, this is basically applying intermediate value theorem, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, the polynomial I use in this example is the same polynomial I used earlier. Okay. So p negative three is what uh, negative sixty eight, right? Uh, how do we get this negative sixty eight? Uh, do synthetic division. Do synthetic division. 
okay? But we still need to find what is P1 though. Now, you help me find what is P1. So you're suggesting to go through synthetic division as opposed to plugging it in? Yeah, you, have, you basically have either way right now. Twelve. Twelve. That's right. Okay. So if you use synthetic diffusion, you will get twelve. If you plug that in, by the way, by the way, by the way, everybody, get me, get me your attention. Uh, when we try to find x equals to one, I mean a p one, for example, for polynomial, I hope you notice that we basically add the coefficients. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yes. So just just for x equals to one, just for x equals to one, if I try to find uh, what is the value of that polynomial, just add the coefficients. Okay? That's faster than synthetic diffusion. But that's only apply for uh, a polynomial and when we try to observe at x equals to one. Give me a second. My son is bothering me right now. Give me a second. Peter, no. No, Peter. Go on, please. please. No matter, Papa. Papa's working. <laughs> <laughs> now, oh, by the way, now then from here you see that if I connect that with intermediate value theorem, notice that uh, P negative 3 and P1 has opposite sign, right? Mm -hmm. Therefore, by intermediate value theorem, by intermediate value theorem, uh, there is. Uh, at least zero. one zero. At least one zero. There is, uh, there is a zero between x equals to negative three and x equals to one. You are right. Uh, to be more precise, uh, at least a zero. You see? So connecting to what we learned before in the intermediate value theorem, uh, when we try to find the value at A, what is the value at B, now we can use synthetic division. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. now, uh, furthermore, you know what? <laughs> My son is bothering me a lot. Uh, let's take a little break here for maybe five, ten minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay, we will start again. Uh, earlier we have used uh, remainder theorem uh, where we define a polynomial, uh, we have a polynomial and we want to find the value of that polynomial at certain x. Let's do another example just to remind us again. Uh, let's say I pick <clears throat> a question number it's in question number 38. Question number 38 on the same page. Uh, page uh, 199. I have uh, fx equals to 8x to the fifth minus 3x squared plus 7, and we want to find what is the value of f1 half. So, uh, using the idea of remainder theorem, I have 8 for degree of 5, 0 for degree of 4, 0 for degree of 3, negative 3 for degree of 2, 0 for degree of 1, and constant. While the number I put uh, on the second row outside of the box is half. Now then, can you perform this synthetic division?
Uh, hold on. Do you hear me, by the way? Everybody, are you listening? Are you following or not coming back from break yet? I forgot to tell you how long was the break. Okay, let me just continue again. Uh, okay, I assume you have performed that synthetic division. This is eight here times one half is four. This is four here times one half is two. Two here times one half is one. This is negative two times one half is negative one. Negative one times one half is negative one half. So I get uh, 6.5 here. Do you get the same result with me? Let me check just in case I mean, because I cannot hear you. <laughs> Nobody respond to me yet. Uh, so in case I make mistake. Am I okay? Now, suppose that's correct. Suppose that's correct, then uh, we come back here, we get uh, F one half equals to 6.5. Or in case you leave it in fraction, you get 13 over two. Is it okay? Yeah, that's okay. Uh, then let's continue. So that's remainder theorem. Basically, if you want to find uh, P negative three earlier or p one half right just now you can do synthetic division and whatever the remainder uh, will be the value of that polynomial at in this case x equals to one half mm. of course this doesn't mean uh, this is the only way for us to find f one half you still can plug in one half in but you see if uh, compare compare it if if i do f one half by plucking one half in each one of them. That's one half out of five minus three to the one times one half squared plus seven. I think this is actually a lot harder to compute, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, either we have a, a bad fractions or very big numbers in other case. So instead of using a plucking me method, we have an alternative method now using synthetic division. Now, the consequence of this uh, remainder theorem, the consequence of remainder theorem is factor theorem. Let me write it out. The consequence. Now, factor theorem says this. If the polynomial Px be divided by x minus c gives remainder 0, then x minus c is a factor of Px. Let's see the simple one, for example. For example, uh, suppose uh, we have x squared minus 5x plus 6 divided by x minus 2. Now, we know that numerator is actually factorable, right? 
Okay, but suppose I don't realize that, and then I say, oh, you know what? Let me use synthetic division. One, maybe five, six divided by x minus two. So what should I put here? Uh, two, positive two. Mm -hmm. Then when I perform the synthetic division, I get the remainder is zero. Now, once the remainder is zero, uh, then it means uh, if remainder is zero, it means uh, x minus two is a factor. That's according to the factor theorem. Now you can see here, uh, because the remainder is zero, then I get only x minus three, right? No remainder. But if the remainder is zero, it also means that uh, x squared minus five x plus six. If I multiply both sides by x minus two, then I will get x minus two times x minus three without remainder. Now, once we don't have remainder, it means because it doesn't have remainder, then x minus two is a factor. Is he okay? Uh, Regan, just come back. I happen to see you, Regan, so let me give you some time to see what we did in the last couple of minutes. Okay, let me continue. Uh, that's what we did, and this is the consequence of consequence of uh, remainder theorem is factor theorem. If we divide the polynomial by x minus c, and we get the remainder equals to zero. I think my 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 grammar is a bit off. Sorry, I need to erase something. If px divided by x minus c gives r equals to zero, now then x minus c is a factor of px. Now, this is an example. Let me do one more example from the book. For For example, number 42, the same, the same page, number 42, I get fx equals to 4x, oops, sorry. want to see is x equals to 3 a 0 or x and then the way I do it I will perform synthetic division and see if the remainder is 0 if the remainder is 0 then uh, x equals to 3 is a 0, and therefore it is also a factor. x minus 3 is a factor. Right. Is he okay? Yes.
because f3 is a zero, because f3 is a zero, consequently, then we can now factor that polynomial x, 4x cubed minus 9x squared minus 8x minus 3 to be x minus 3 times Probably x minus one, huh? Hmm. No. Uh, let's write Is it, it in four x square plus three x plus one. That's correct. Okay. So uh, let me write it in different way first to connect to what we learned before. So basically, what I did in my synthetic division was this: four x cubed minus 9x squared minus 8x minus 3. I divide by x minus 3. It gives me 4x squared plus 3x plus 1. Is it right? Now yes. imagine uh, with remainder 0. So because the remainder 0, then uh, this is a factor of uh, the polynomial. And this is the other factor. Uh, imagine mm -hmm. if I multiply by the LCD. If I multiply by the LCD, uh, then this is what I get. Is it right? Now, yeah. from here, actually, I want to show you something our textbook does not explicitly say, but actually a very, very important concept. I usually call it the trinity of zero. Uh, basically, the following. Uh, let Px be a polynomial. Then we have this situation. Uh, PC equals to zero means what? So this is this actually that means, means C is a factor. Uh, almost right. It means X minus C is a factor. right mm -hmm. now at the same time at the same time we also know that if pc equals to zero which means c is a zero then c comma zero is a x-intercept Okay, so if C is a zero, that's basically the definition of uh, the zeros. If C is a zero of Px, it means x minus C is a factor, and at the same time, C is an x-intercept. Of course, the assumption is C is a real number, okay? Now, therefore, to connect to much, much earlier on how to graph a a uh, polynomial in factored form, for us to find the x-intercept, we need to factor it, right? Now, sometimes we cannot factor it because it's the degree of that polynomial is too high. It's, let's say, degree of four, degree of five, and we have no way to actually factor it uh, using a regular method. Then we do guessing later on. Now, as long as we can find a zero, then we kind of fact we find the factor. Let me give you an example that I don't think I can find it in the book. Uh, let me find out from, okay. Uh, you can see my screen, right? Let me do this. Do you see me going to my browser? No. No, no. No. Okay, let me. Change the sharing there. Go to my browser here. Uh, 
I'm going to my website. Yeah. Okay, now we can see the browser. Mm -hmm. uh, .com. Let me pick Spring 19. Is it test two or test three? I don't Yeah, it must be test three. Ah, let me use this one. with me I need to reformat this so that it seems to be better so let's say we have this polynomial here and let's say we have this polynomial and I asked you to factor it <clears throat> there's no way we can factor it with what we learn right now right okay no way uh, that's asking you too much at this point if I ask you to do that. But let's see, uh, can we find what is P1? P1 is just adding the coefficients, right? Is it equals to zero? Can you confirm that using your calculator? Yeah, it equals to zero. Yeah, zero. Now, once once one is a zero. It means, it means x minus one is a factor. Is it right? Then I can use synthetic division to reduce the polynomial. by degree of one. Now I can write my polynomial Px as x minus 1 because 1 is a factor, therefore x minus 1, I'm sorry, 1 is a 0, therefore x minus 1 is a factor. And the other factor of this polynomial is 2x to the 4 plus 5x cubed minus 28x squared minus 87x minus 36. Are you with me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, let me ask you to try again, but this time apply that to only this. Apply this only this. I know when I add the coefficients, when I add the coefficient, it doesn't give me zero anymore. Uh, but let me ask you to find what if I plug in negative one here. 
So let's call this a new polynomial uh, P1 star. 2x to the 4 plus 5x cubed minus 28x squared minus 87x minus 36. Now, use synthetic division to see if negative 1 is a 0. It's not up. Huh? I really thought it is. Oh, that was negative 56. So that was positive oh, thank 56. You. Thank you, thank you. You'll find it. So this is positive point. Hmm. So negative one is not a zero. Negative one is not a zero for this p star x. Hmm. But uh, so it means p star negative one is what? Two x q? Oh no, it won't be. If you oh. plug in, if you plug in, oh no, the factor, not the factor, uh, the value at negative one. So if I plug in negative one into this polynomial here, if I plug in negative one into this polynomial, what will the outcome be? Twenty. Hmm. Twenty. Uh, twenty. That's right. Okay. But at the same time, if you take a look, what is P star zero? Negative 36. You are right. Uh, but according to intermediate value theorem, there must be a zero between. So then, uh, using something we will learn in future, something called rational zero theorem, uh, then we guess between x equals zero and x equals to negative one. Uh, let's pick, for example, uh, one half maybe. Let's try negative one half. I mean. Try if I use negative one half here. Ah, that's a zero. Surprise. So you knew there was a zero there, so you just you, you just actually, chose a, the midpoint. Just... Uh, I was actually guessing. I happen to guess it right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how to guess it better? We will see that in the next meeting on Wednesday. But le let me go on from here first. So uh, to answer your question, how do I know negative one half is a zero? I didn't know. I just guess. But why don't I use let's say negative one fifth? Uh, we know, we know that there must be a zero between negative one and zero, right? Between negative mm -hmm. one and zero, there must be a zero. Uh, but I don't know what number. Why don't you use negative one fifth, Thomas? Uh, why do you use negative one half? Why don't you use uh, negative two thirds? Now that's something I will explain on Wednesday. And to be honest with you, when I pick negative one half, uh, I was guessing it and I'm lucky right now. Okay, but at least I know the following right now that the original polynomial 
the original polynomial, we know that x minus one is a factor, right? Earlier. Okay, now we know uh, negative one half is a zero, therefore x plus one half is a factor, agree? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I basically already factor this part here. I already factor this part further. I already factor this part further. Now becomes x plus two, uh, x plus one half times, times what? Anybody can help me? Well, that would be two x to the third or whatever. Uh, that's right, plus or x Five. squared yeah. minus 3, 30x minus 72, is it right? Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, from there you see that we have common factor two right now in here. Let mm -hmm. me factor the two out. So two times x minus one, x plus one half, x cubed plus two x squared minus 15x minus 36. Is it okay? Now then, from here we can actually factor it further though. We can try to factor it further. Uh, I'm not sure, but let me try. I think three will do. I will factor, I try to factor this further. I know my time is up, but let me finish this, okay? Uh, let me try to factor this using x minus three. I'm guessing this. I hope I'm right. Okay, one, two, negative 15, negative 36. No, it's not. Okay, it's not. Three doesn't work. Let me try four. Four will do. Yeah, four will do. Uh, which means what? I can factor that. X big... minus four. Yeah. X minus four is a factor. A factor. So notice that I start with the degree of five, and I reduce that to the degree of four. Now I have a degree of three. Once I get x minus four to be the degree of to be a factor, now I have with, I have left a degree of two. So finding a zero give me a factor. Finding a factor will help me find the zero of the remaining factor. Do you see how I play this game? Mm -hmm. It's a long journey though. It's not a short journey. So I start from this x minus one is a factor, and then x plus one is a factor, and then. I'm sorry, x plus one half is a factor. Now we have x plus four is a factor. Uh, you then, can still factor. Yes, that's right. Actually, I can factor this further, but do I need synthetic diffusion? No, at this point, no. no. Just factor. Yeah, we can just factor it further. So if you think about it, uh, degree of five, we keep on dropping it down to degree of four, degree of three, degree of two. Once you get the degree of two, we can factor it using regular way, or if it is not factorable, we can find the zero by, uh, let's say, uh, quadratic formula. Now here we have x plus three squared, right? Okay, so yes. notice that, notice that once we fully factor this polynomial, once we fully factor this polynomial, I can graph that already. Let's do the sign graph. So the zeros are one, negative three, negative one half. Let me change this to negative one half, one, and then four. 
it's degree of 5 with the, uh, the degree of 5, the n is 5, the leading coefficient is positive 2. So uh, it will be from negative infinity on the far right, far, far left, and positive infinity on the far right. Agree? Yes. Mm -hmm. And all these uh, zeros basically give us critical numbers. Okay, now can anybody help me? What will be the sign here? Negative. Can you explain why, Reg Regan? Because the it's because it's a one, the m value is one. The multiplicity of the zero four, four as a zero, it's the odd, multiplicity yeah. is odd. That's right. Okay, so we change sign. Now how about from here to here? Change again. Uh, because one is zero with multiplicity with odd multiplicity. Right? Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. to confirm uh, when x equals to zero was the value. We can see from the constant of the polynomial before we factor it. You see? Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the y intercept is positive, and we confirm that using another method. Now, then uh, x equals to negative one half is a zero with odd multiplicity, so I change sign, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. However, negative three is a zero with multiplicity of two. So I don't change sign. So remember the technique we used before, we pick a point in this interval, we test that, pick a point in this interval testing that. Right now we don't do that anymore. And to go even further, in fact, I already use remainder theorem, factor theorem, intermediate value theorem, uh, synthetic division to actually help me to graph this polynomial. The y-intercept is positive 36. The x-intercepts are negative 3, negative 1 half, 1, and 4. And then from the sine graph and the far end behavior, the sine graph and far end behavior, I see that it comes from negative infinity. When I touch negative three, do I go up or down? Down. You go down. You go That's right, down. because between negative three to negative one half is negative, which means it's below x axis. And then when I touch negative one half, do I go up or down? Uh, up. You go up. I go up. And when I touch 36, then I go to y. When I touch uh, 1 comma 0, do I go up or down? Down. You go down. I go down because the sign graph says it's negative. And when I go to touch 4 here, I go up or down? Up. 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 Oops. Sorry. There you go. Now we graph this polynomial. Now we graph, we already graph this polynomial. Now again, this procedure is not a simple procedure. It's a long procedure. Uh, in the next meeting, we will uh, see more, uh, see more uh, theorem. But uh, you can start reading 3.3 .3 and I think 3.3 .3 and 3.4. Yeah, you can read 3.3, 3.4. Ignore the complex, uh, complex uh, zeros thing. Uh, basically, we will learn uh, more things that we learn. Uh, the important one is rational zero theorem. You can Google online. I will also post the lecture video online. Rational zero theorem. Descartes rule of sign. Uh, and then conjugate zero theorem.
Now, none of these theorems actually help us uh, give us the exact zero and therefore x intercept and the factors, but it helps us to narrow down our options. Okay, uh, I think that's for today. I think in the evening, later on, afternoon or evening, I will give you the lecture video from YouTube that you can watch uh, to help to give you a preview of what we will do on uh, on Wednesday. Is everybody okay? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Then see you then on Wednesday. Oh, by the way, I will start. I will start at eight forty because that's my office hour. Yeah, I will start at eight forty because that's my office hour. If you have any question, you can you can ask me during that time. Oh. Uh, remind me on Wednesday, however, that uh, one of you, I assume more than just one of you, would like me to go over how to find the domain of a uh, composition of function again. Yes, please. Okay, yeah, please remind me, okay? Please remind okay. me. So, okay. So, do we have, do we have homework or? Uh, I put the suggested homework on, uh, on. Canvas or? Uh, the campus something yeah is it camp well i don't know if 3.3 .3 and 3.4 but uh no on for 3.1 3.2 i put the lecture fee, uh the i put the what's that and canvas you put the homework i think yeah. you, you put it in an announcement or something that you oh, sent yeah? uh last week or during the weekend uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. and it had the links to what you were supposed to watch and then on top of those links it also had the suggested homework yeah, let me see. Yeah, here, here. Yeah, that there. one. So I have the suggested homework for, uh, maybe you can do the 3.1, 3.2 first, and then 2.7, we do it later. I will give you something look like this, uh, this afternoon or evening uh, okay, for 3.3, 3.4. Okay. Okay. We'll wait for that. Thank you. Okay. Mm, see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care. Take care, you too.